My name is Andrew, and today I'd like to talk about thoughts. I'd like to share some thoughts about thoughts, if that's not too abstract. <laughs> I'm incredibly fascinated by this question. What are thoughts? Have you ever really looked at it? Have you ever really pondered for a second just what is going on upstairs in that old treasure chest you've got between the ears? Of course, as we always do in these sorts of conversations, we like to get intellectual. We can use our psychological systems to analyze thoughts. So we can look at Piaget, or we can look at spiral dynamics, or we can look at various cognitive structures. But I'd also like to share some of my experiential, subjective insights into thoughts. We can also do questions of comparison, questions of contrast that will help us Break up this question. Break up some of the answers to this question. What are thoughts? What is thinking? What is it good for? What is it used for? Why do we have it? These sorts of subset questions get at different angles to it. You can learn a lot about how you think by saying, what do you use thoughts for? It implies a sort of instrumental or material gain aspect to thinking. And by contrast, we can say, well, is thinking acting? Is thinking an action? Are thoughts a way of acting? Or do we keep this word action or doing Strictly for the movement of the body, the movement of your arms, hands, feet, so on, the way you move around the world throughout your day. Where exactly do we draw that line? Maybe it depends on what sort of conversation we're having or what sort of structure we're trying to create. We can try and compartmentalize thoughts. Where does one thought and the other begin? Is this the start of a thought? Is that the end of a thought? We usually say, I am thinking about something. I am thinking on something. I'm meditating on something. I'm contemplating something. So all these thoughts are related to one thing. So we're categorizing thoughts by subject material, by thematic material. We can also have different colours and weights and tones to thoughts. We can have judgmental thoughts. Have you ever noticed those ones? Have you ever noticed that thought that says you're not good enough? That wasn't very good. That was a bad idea. That wasn't successful. What did you do that for? That wasn't very clever. Of course, that's you thinking that about you. Isn't it interesting that within our thoughts we have different conflicting arrows of direction? And I think the judging mind has its utility. Every mechanism is born for a reason. Every mechanism is there to be used for something. This is what the positive thinking people or the personal power self-help gurus are trying to get at, but they don't quite take it far enough. They say, think positive, think positive, think good about yourself, which of course is bullshit. What you really should think is, well, it's not for me to tell you how to think, but what that mechanism is trying to get at is you should think with an accurate judgment. So you should be using a wider variety of options to judge 
whether something is positive or negative. Because sometimes you do need to say that something is negative. You do need to have bad thoughts. So let's move into something concrete, something psychological, something quite easy. We can do spiral dynamics. So starting at the bottom with the babies, we've got beige. It's the beige wave of development. So at this stage, thoughts, objects, and reality, self and other, is not very well differentiated. Very little is known about this stage. It's very hard to put it into concrete terms because it's so abstract. There's a very pervasive sense of oneness without complexity, without differentiation. So a baby, in a sense, doesn't have thoughts until they move into this higher stage, which is stage purple. This is the stage of family. This is the stage of mummy and daddy. It's interesting that mum or dad is usually one of the first words the baby says because these characters are the most dominant. If we really want to be technical, one of the first words that a baby says is that or other or there is a thing. Whatever sound they come up with, what they're trying to say is that there is something there that is different to it. It and other is the first differentiation that a baby makes. By the time you get into the purple stage of development, thoughts are more about your family relations, your tribal relations. Thoughts are the same for everyone. Everyone thinks the same way, or at least that's how it appears to you. When you move into stage red on your spiral dynamics, thoughts are connected to your emotions. Thoughts are born secondary to your emotions because you are driven by passion. So you are driven by your bodily impulse you are driven by getting things for yourself and action and feeling are center stage. So thoughts are only there as a byproduct because red on spiral dynamics is the stage of passion and greed. Once you move on from red, you move into blue. So blue is the hierarchical dogmatism, power from a higher being stage of development. So thoughts are there to help you conform. You should have good thoughts and bad thoughts. There are correct thoughts and incorrect thoughts. Of course, at blue, there is a very moralistic element to the stage of development, so that comes in through your thinking. So thoughts are at blue, just another gift that has been given to you to be used in order to adhere to the person that has given you that gift. And it doesn't have to be God, it could be a system, it could be a military structure, it could be an institution could be any form of dogmatism or ideology. Blue exists, of course, beyond religion, but religion is the classic case because it's so easy to point out stage blue on spiral dynamics with religion. After blue, we've got orange. So orange is the stage of spiral dynamics, which is about material gain and technology. And here, thoughts start to become more of a thing unto themselves. Thoughts be the things that you use in order to gain something. You are starting to compartmentalize thoughts unto themselves. You change your thinking to change your lifestyle. You change your thinking in order to get better. 
You improve your thinking to improve your bank account. Mindset coach, this sort of thing. So at Orange, thoughts are a doorway into something greater by way of material or exterior world gain. Which is not just money, it's also sensory pleasures. Red and orange actually have a interesting correlation because they are both self-centered and they are both exterior world based. But they do have their differences in that orange is a lot more strategic and mathematical in the way they think and red is still much more passionate, much more impulsive. So once we get past orange, we get to green. Green is the opening up of pluralism. So green is where probably the first stage where one realizes that people think differently. You can't understand that there are different thoughts inside other people's heads until you get to stage green. So if you can understand that people think differently, or to the degree that people think differently, according to you, is the degree in which you can open up to pluralism, which is stage green on Spiral Dynamics. So at stage green, everyone has different thoughts, and everyone is to be respected. And in a sense, thoughts start to lose their weight, their significance, their utility. Because anyone can think anything, which means therefore thoughts must be inept. They must be meaningless. They must be pointless. This is the downside of pluralism, which is that meaning falls away. Now, after green, we step over into second tier. And this is our monumental leap of meaning. This is our cataclysmic shattering of understanding. <laughs> the avalanche. <laughs> the Grand Canyon. <laughs> We've talked about second tier thinking before and the drama that involves. But the first stage on second tier thinking is stage yellow. And at stage yellow, thoughts become many things. Thoughts can be used in a utilitarian sort of way. Thoughts can be manipulated. Thoughts can be developed. Thoughts are neither a pusher of feelings or a backseat observer of feelings. They can be both things that drive feelings or that are a byproduct of feelings. Thoughts have a more complicated relationship to reality, action, strategy, expression. So thoughts at stage yellow become this huge bursting of different complexities. It really opens up because yellow, remember, has the ability to use all the preceding stages. So yellow is using thoughts for passion, They're using them for hierarchies and understanding systems, They're using them for material gain, they're understanding that everyone has different thoughts, so they're exploring different kinds of thinking, they're expanding their different ways of thinking. So the systemization of differentiating kinds of thoughts and patterns, both in terms of context and thematic content, and flows of thoughts or ways of thinking, is an absolute bursting at yellow. Yellow is really where thoughts open up into this thing in and of themselves, and one can start to work on that in a whole variety of ways. After yellow, we've got turquoise. So turquoise is a stage which understands the limits of thought. And turquoise can enter into states of consciousness which are completely void of what one would call thinking. 
which includes all the different various arrays of kinds of thinking that we see at stage yellow. So turquoise can turn off the thoughts because they can see that no matter how much yellow has to offer in its many different ways of thinking, thought unto itself is inadequate for these higher stages of consciousness, of existence. And this is paired with a deeper clarity of thought. Because once you can step outside of a mechanism, you can manipulate it much easier. Someone at Turquoise will think less, but they will think with more clarity. So their thoughts will be sharper. They will be easier to get to the point. They won't fluff around. There's a similar correlation with action. And the further down the chain you are, further down the waves you are, you are more prone to doing actions in a hastily sort of way. And you're hustling and bustling. But the further up the waves you go, the more accurate your actions get, the more to the point your actions get, until you're actually doing no actions. You're withdrawing from your actions and making actions something that pushes with a high degree of efficiency and effectiveness. So we see the same correlation with thoughts. Now at any second tier way of thinking, thoughts are differentiated quite well and even subdivided into multiple things. This goes with a correlation among many different lines of development, including emotional differentiation, action, moral development, identity development. These all have similar correlations. So the relationship one has with thought as they progress through the waves of development such as on spiral dynamics, changes within a web of experiences. So those are some of the ideas we have about thoughts in relation to spiral dynamics. Although spiral dynamics isn't the only system we can use to understand thoughts, one psychologist, developmental psychologist, probably one of the most famous developmental psychologists, is Piaget, who focused on early learning cognition. And he studied how children could come to understand things and how they could think. Now, when a baby comes into the world, and they learn to differentiate between themselves and the other, objects and the inanimate and the animate, they come across items, and at first, their thoughts are, they are labels of things. So it will find a ball, it will find a chair, it will find a blanket, it will find a toy. And this object will get a label, because mummy will point and say, that is label, that is sound with mouth. And the baby will be copying that sound with mouth. Of course, it's a complicated process. There's audio experimentation, there's phonetics, there's other environmental factors, there's this huge seething pot, this cauldron of bubbling influences. But Piaget was able to figure out that one of the key stages in the development of a baby was when they could label an object. Now, beyond the formal, operational thinking, the baby learns to categorize objects. So this happens when the baby finds a chair and they see another chair. They come into contact with a number of different chairs. And they have to expand 
their understanding of what this word chair means. Because each chair is actually quite different. There are different kinds of chairs. There are colors, shapes, positions, different ways in which they're used. Office chairs, desk chairs, kitchen table chairs, outdoor chairs. And as the baby is getting all this new data, as the child is getting all this new data, they have to adjust their understanding of what this word chair means. And this is when they move into symbolic thinking, symbolic representation. So Piaget did great research into the cognitive development of children. And these problems or this data that the child comes into has to create a way of thinking that will deal with that data. So thought develops in direct correlation to your experience of reality. So we can say perspective is every single thing that has gone in through your eyeballs. So if we film, if we set up a camera next to your head and we film every single thing while your eyes are open, we of course record the sound as well, and we take that film and lay it all out as a feature film, unedited, then what you say about that film is your perspective. Now, the mind has a way of picking significant events, summarizing certain parts of your perspective, rejecting and denying parts of your perspective, and moving towards or away from certain points in your perspective. So how you think is in relation to your perspective. Your thoughts are a, not necessarily a byproduct, but they are in relation to your perspective. And of course, it's the chicken or the egg which comes first, perspective or thoughts. In a sense, they're one and the same. But if you can keep this image of every single thing that you've ever seen in mind, then you can understand how thoughts are struggling to get to a way of moving throughout the world and a way of understanding the world. From one perspective, or from one way of going at this question, what are thoughts? By putting on psychological maps, we're entirely missing the point. We're being thrown off course. We're being deluded into thinking that we know what thoughts are. Because all these psychological maps are just intellect. They're just words. And what we really need to understand what thoughts are is to look at them directly. And this means sitting down, closing our eyes and listening to them. Now, what happens when we do this is we run into a similar problem that the baby runs into, or the child runs into, when they're finding new chairs, they're finding new objects that don't fit with their original labels. So you've got this label, ball, and it correlates with an object. And then you see another object, and you try and fit that object under your label, it doesn't work or it does work. So you are using these words as labels for objects and this same thing happens when we sit down and look at our thoughts because we say this is one kind of thought and this is another kind of thought 
We first have to recognize that there are different kinds of thoughts, just like the baby has to first recognize that there are different kinds of objects. But as we're going along listening to our thoughts, we have to cram them into categories. Some categories work, some don't. Some are very clear, some are not. And we might find that things come up that we can't categorize. We can't explain, we can't put a word to. And this is how you know you're making progress into the inquiring into the nature of thought. What are thoughts? What are thoughts fundamentally? Are they words? Are they really just words? Well, that just seems to be moving the question along one more step because we can say, what are words? Of course, you can have thoughts that are also pictures. You can have thoughts that are sounds. And isn't it interesting that the thoughts we have somehow seem to be not quite as real as looking out our eyes at certain times, but at other times they seem to be much more real than what's looking out our eyes, what it's like to look out your eyes. Because we can say we look at reality with our eyes open and it's right there, it's obvious, it's the most real thing. But if we look hard enough, we can see that there are blurred edges around the outside. We've only got one point of focus, really. And even that we are always moving around, looking at different things, makes this idea that we can look at reality and understand it directly in a real sense sort of undermined. It makes it sort of a bit fleeting. And we can see the same thing with our thoughts, because if we listen hard enough to our thoughts, they might not be sounds, they might not be words. And you can try this, you can say, well, let's just do some thinking, which is just pictures. So let's turn off the voice in your head and turn on the film of your head. So it's going to be the silent film version of thinking. And let's just practice the visual. Let's just practice the visual. So what, what colors are there? What shapes are there? What movement is there? What sort of lighting is there? Is it a complex picture? Is it a simple picture? What's the content of the picture? Of course, you can picture all sorts of things. Is it possible to picture something that you've never seen before? And where is the line really between what you have and haven't seen before? Because you might be using elements of things you've seen before in a new way. You might be creatively visualizing. You can say, well, I can visualize myself being in a place that I've never been before. But really, you've got some idea of what that place looks like and you've got some idea of what you look like. So you are comparing your, you are combining your two different kinds of thoughts to create your own visualization. Now, visualization is another one of those things that the orange meme has taken over to use for its material gain. So visualizing is different for each wave of development. And in a sense, we're always visualizing and this word visualization is a, another skewer of thought or it's another parameter of thought. What it really means is the visual, the sensation of sight within the mind, which is distinctly different to the sensation of words as sounds, which is what we might call cognition or psychology. So by listening to thoughts as words and looking at thoughts as visuals, 
We're starting to divide our thoughts into different categories. We're starting to differentiate the complexities of thought. How about this one? This is a really good one. <laughs> I like this one. Where is thought located? This one really gets at the heart of the matter. If you can find where your thoughts are located, <laughs> oh boy, are you in for a fun little surprise. <laughs> so, just a few moments ago, we were visualizing, and you might have been thinking of a place, or you might be thinking of a place, you can think of a place right now, if you're doing a visualization, and you can say, well, where are your thoughts? Are your thoughts at that place? Have you heard that saying, where's your head at? I'm not thinking here. My thinking isn't here. My thinking isn't present. Be present. Be here now. <laughs> Where are your thoughts located? And of course, we can ask this question not just on the visual side, but we can ask this on the cognition side. We can say, well, where are these words coming from? Who said these words? We can also say, who's listening to this cognition? Where is the point of attention of these thoughts? Where are these thoughts generally? Where is the expanse of the thoughts located? Where are the expanses? So, the location of thought is another skewer into the inquiring of the nature of thought. So, with these little entrances into the question, what is thought? What are thoughts? It's obvious that no one can tell you what thoughts are. So I've given you a whole bunch of words, a whole bunch of intellect, which is one step in the direction of going into the nature of thoughts. But as we've discussed, you need experiential practice. You need the experiential work to be done by you. And I can talk through those practices and you can get a little bit of a taste of it. But what you get out of those practices with someone describing them to you will be nowhere near as paramount as doing it yourself on your own terms and gaining that insight on your own terms. So it's very important that we don't diminish intellect, systems, psychologies, philosophy of mind, and we don't neglect the experiential, phenomenological, practicing, inquiring, self-inquiring into the nature of the mind. Because reductionism always falls on both sides. There's always someone in each camp reducing the other camp to less of an importance. So here we're really trying to come at it from both sides and have a two-pronged approach. Like we so often do when we're having these conversations. I hope that's a regular theme that you can see coming up again and again, that the answer is not one answer. The answer is many answers. The answer is all answers. Of course, as we go through spiral dynamics, you see that thoughts are what they are to each wave of development, and they are always those things. They're all those things. So, what is it like to have a experience which goes beyond intellect and also even beyond your own inquiring? At certain points during inquiry, it will not be you 
doing a thing. At the start of this conversation, I asked, is thought an action? Is thought something that you do? Now, depending on where you are at in your inquiry, depends on how you answer that question. So if you are getting deep into your inquiry and you have been doing the inquiry, as in you have been willing it, you have been pushing it, you have been trying to do it, you have been exerting energy in order to move your attention around, in order to find where your thoughts are, under your own initiative, and all these terms, all these things, then your thoughts are classified as an action. Your thinking is an action. If you want to take your inquiry to the next step, you want to look at thoughts without any sort of exertion. Without even really looking, without doing the looking. So, some traditions call this the witness. So, you are witnessing things, you are observing things, but in a sneaky sort of way, even that implies a secret little doingness, an action, because witnessing isn't really meant to be an action. So what happens when you do nothing? What comes up when you are literally not moving, literally not thinking, and literally not inquiring or even witnessing? How do you find zero? So you can see even as I'm trying to explain it, there are limits to words. The trick of words is that they're always pointing to something. They're always nested in directionality, which is why I'm fumbling around trying to describe zero. So even a question has directionality to it. So in simple terms, I should say be zero, be nothing. And I will command that to you and it will happen. And you'll have this experience. Or you'll have this way of understanding. But these are esoteric meditative practices. And you can really figure a lot of things out for yourself by understanding the intellect and... Creating your own practices, creating your own systems, rhythms, learning about other systems of inquiry. There's a whole literature out there on it, so you can do your own research. I don't want to underplay this way of approaching thoughts as something that you can master. So even the idea that thoughts are things to be manipulated and controlled is something quite radical because it only appears at second-tier thinking. It only appears after a certain amount of thinking. And what happens most commonly is people think in regards to their everyday life, their strategizing, their planning, their physical desires. So it's quite rare that people come into the need to isolate thinking as a thing of itself, let alone start to develop it and utilize it to its full parameters. So by venturing out into a description of what the ultimate point of thought would be, I'm going to break all the rules because I shouldn't be telling you what to think. I shouldn't be telling you how to think. In a sense, I've given you tools to inquire into what thought is. But the next step is to say, well, once you know what it is, what do you do with it? How is thought as a mechanism 
and an understanding nested in values? And this question, like so many others, is a chicken or the egg question because your values change as you understand the mechanics of thought more. So differentiation is one of the most fundamental aspects of understanding and moving towards complexity. So you will be differentiating different kinds of thought. And desire or greed is one of the most important propellants which appears all the way throughout the spiral of waves of development, psychological development, and experiential development as well. So we can say that one of the fundamental questions is, what are thoughts used for? And when we ask that, we need to move beyond just the material gain. Because at higher stages, thoughts are used for an experiential gain. So you manipulate your thoughts for a feeling, an emotion, but also a state of consciousness. So we need to distinguish between emotions, feelings, and states of consciousness. But we can't do that until certain mechanisms of thought are understood and certain parameters of thought are understood. So the more you understand thought, the more you get out of it. The more you can manipulate thought, the more gain you can get from it. And the ultimate point of thought, we can say, is really the ultimate point of anything which is to improve the quality of existence. And this means not just for yourself, but for others, for your entire web. It's such a large claim or arrow to use that we really have to break it down into smaller things. This arrow of improving the quality of your existence. Existence is so large, and what we say, you, when we say that word, your, that is also so large, we need to intellectualize it and subdivide it in order to enter into a way of getting there. Look at your thoughts directly, listen to them, as if you were listening to a person talk, and learn about the theories of thought or the structures of thought. No matter where you're at, the answers that you get from questions like what are thoughts? What are thoughts used for? How do we use thoughts? What's the point of thoughts? Are thoughts complicated? Where are thoughts located? What is the content of thought? Are thoughts an action? All these questions will have different answers as you go along in your development of thought. Even just the idea, what is thought? What are thoughts? That answer will change as you're going along. And each time you are moving along waves of development, each answer to the question is real to you. It's specific to you. It's something that can sit right with you. And others, you might say, well, no, I don't understand. I don't get it. How could that be? What would that look like? How would things be if I thought my thoughts were that? You probably just need a little tip over the edge to just a little nudge to get on your way. And if all this seems too heavy, then we can listen to some funky outro music to help pick up the beat. Pick up your spirits. Don't be so philosophical. Come on, have fun. Thanks very much for tuning in. 
My name is Andrew, and we'll be back soon with more. Hope you're having a beautiful day. What are for?